We hope you enjoy listening to this weekly podcast from Lifeline Church. Find out more by visiting lifelinechurch.co.uk. God's this morning wanting to minister to people who are really under a weight of disappointment. We're going to do that right now. Behold our God. You see, our God is not a disappointment. We all face disappointments in life at different times, some more painful than others. But as we turn and look at him, we find that he is greater than anything and any situation and any circumstance. So now I want you to just be honest before God and say, yes, if that word resonated with you, let's be hearers and doers of the word. Let's just take a moment and look to see what God the Holy Spirit will do for you right now. And all we ask is that you give glory to God and that you come and say, God lifted something. Let's pray together. You're not a disappointment, Lord. We choose to behold you. We choose to look now in your face by the power of the Holy Spirit. You've brought us into your family to the point that we can say, Abba, Father. You're touched with the feelings of our infirmities. And Lord, for each one that stands before you at this time, actually recognizes and responds to that word about disappointment. We ask now, Lord, that you would grant by your grace, by your spirit, a Holy Spirit anointed ability to look to you and find, Lord, that you're not a disappointment. And Lord, that the pain of that disappointment is lifted. Is lifted in a way which is beyond natural explanation. Come, Lord, please now confirm your word with signs following. In the name of Jesus, amen. Amen. Good morning, everyone. Um, It's good to be here today. Um, I want to talk a little bit about um, the theme that John's been picking up in the last few weeks of friendship and just some thoughts and and ponderings have been um, going around my head to do with that. Um, But first, I want to uh, look at a passage, uh, a scripture in Acts. Um, It's just going to kind of lay a few foundations of of what I want to talk about this morning. So we'll read it and then we'll we'll throw around some thoughts to do with that. Um, The passage I want to read is in Acts 1. So if you've got your Bibles, um, feel free to turn to Acts 1 verse 12. And the point where we pick up this um, passage is it's the moment when Jesus has ascended to heaven. So he's been to the cross, he's died, he's raised from the dead and um, and he's ascended into heaven and the disciples have gone back to Jerusalem and they're, they're maybe wondering what's going to happen. Jesus has said wait until uh, my spirit comes and they're there in the upper room and that's where we we pick up the story so we'll read from verse 12 to verse 14. It says then they returned to Jerusalem from the mount called Olivet which is near Jerusalem a Sabbath day's journey away and when they had entered they went up to the upper room where they were staying Peter and John and James and Andrew Philip and Thomas Bartholomew and Matthew James the son of Alphaeus and Simon the zealot and Judas the son of James all these with one accord were devoting themselves to prayer together with the women and Mary the mother of Jesus and his brothers So we have a picture here of Jesus' closest friends uh, on earth, the people that he did everything with, he he lived with, ministered with, shared life with, ate with, um, and they're together and and they're praying. But I I find it really interesting when I I look at this list of names of the people that make up his disciples, they're not the likeliest of, of friends. When you look at it, they're not the type of people that you would expect necessarily to be friends had Jesus not been involved. Um, you've got a, a bunch of fishermen, 
Um, you've got a tax collector who, you know, the tax collectors weren't particularly liked in those days. They were known to sort of side with the Romans. And so the Jews just didn't really like the tax collectors. You've got a guy called Simon the Zealot thrown in there. And, you know, that's, I don't know who he was or what he was like, but with a name like that, he must have had a bit of a, a personality to him. Um, I don't think they would have been, been likely friends. And yet what brings them together was Jesus and the work that he had done in their lives. This wasn't a natural thing, but here they are in, in the upper room of one accord, of one mind, of one purpose, and they're praying. I came across a, a quote recently. Um, it's a quote, a quote I read a number of years ago, but I, I stumbled across it again recently. And it just, again, sparked some thoughts around this, this idea of, of friendship. And it's by a guy called uh, Dietrich Bonhoeffer. I don't know if you've heard of him, um, but he was a German uh, pastor and theologian from the last century. And he wrote a number of books um, and he lived sort of during the time of the Second World War. And he was actually a, an outspoken critic of, of the Nazi regime, ended up in concentration camp and, and lost his life um, at the hand of the Nazis. But interesting guy. And, and he wrote a number of books. And this particular quote comes from a book called The Cost of Discipleship that he wrote. Um, and I just want to read it. Um, I have sort of paraphrased it slightly. Uh, he has quite flowery language and it's translated from German as well, which doesn't help as well. So it can be quite difficult to understand his writing, but, but hopefully um, it will be clear for us today. So I'll read the quote. It says, we are separated from one another by a big chasm of difference, which we cannot cross by any attempt to relate to one another emotionally or spiritually. There is no natural way from one person to another. However loving or sympathetic we may try to be, however well we may think we understand how the other person thinks, however vulnerable and open our behavior, we can never bridge that gap. Christ stands between us and we can only get fully into touch with our neighbors through him. That is why intercession is the most promising way to reach our neighbors and corporate prayer offered in the name of Christ, the purest form of fellowship. There's a lot, a lot in there, and I'm sure we could spend a long time chewing over all of the, the nuggets that are contained in that quote. But um, the thing that really stands out to me at, at the center of it is this idea that no matter how hard we try, naturally speaking, to make, to try and understand how people think, to try and be vulnerable, to try and be open, if it's out of our own strength, if it's a natural thing, we just can't do it. There will always be a gap. There will always be a difference. Just like the disciples, unlikely group of people bunched together. But Bonhoeffer says, Christ stands between us and through him, we can have fellowship. In him, we can have true connection. And I find that just incredible. Just like the disciples, it doesn't matter how different we may think we are, if we come to each other through Jesus, um, we can do that. And he, he finishes with this line, which, which really stuck in my mind and, and challenged me, where he says, this is why intercession is the most promising way to reach our neighbors and corporate prayer offered in the name of Christ, the purest form of fellowship. So he's talking about prayer being a, a key vehicle, a key way that, that this uh, supercharging, if you like, of, of these friendships and connections can happen. So we return to this picture in Acts of these this unlikely group of people together um, in that upper room, not socially distanced, I might, might add, uh, 120 people, it goes on to say, it's a lot of people in, in one room, um, but they're there and they're praying and they're of one accord. I just reflect on the fact that when we think about the early church, when we think about Acts, we think of the miracles, we think of the revival, the salvations of thousands of people coming to know Jesus, we think of the shared life, the eating together, the selling of possessions, the distributing of, uh, need, of everything that people needed was, was provided. We think of all of those hallmarks of the early church. But I read this passage, this um, passage that is very easy to skip over and miss. And I think in that passage is the seed of everything else that happened afterwards. In that picture of the disciples together of one Lord praying is the beginning of everything that went on to happen, everything that God did in the church. The church is born out of this context of oneness 
and of encountering God together. And I want to talk about this idea of prayer this morning. And, and I just want to say, when I talk about prayer, I'm not talking about, you know, let's organize more corporate prayer meetings. Let's, you know, create a new function to enable this to happen. Corporate prayer meetings are great. I love First Tuesday prayer. It's a great time to come together. But I'm not talking about necessarily another spiritual thing to add into our lives. John was talking last week about being naturally spiritual. And that's what I'm really interested in. How can we add this element of awareness of Jesus, of connecting with one another, fellowshipping with one another through him into the things that we're already doing with him at the center? And I believe there's something in this that will get us to that kind of supercharged friendship that we're seeking at the time at, at the moment so Bonhoeffer talks about two kinds of prayer and I want to just briefly touch on on both of these and unpack them a little bit he talks about intercession um, which we'll look at first and then corporate prayer so let's dig into intercession um, intercession is a big word and and often we can struggle to, to understand what it what it means essentially I want to describe it like this it's going before God on behalf of my friends that's how I, I understand intercession to be. And I want to just share a story about how God taught me about the importance of going before God on, on behalf of my friends. Um, a number of years ago, I was in Florence in Italy, beautiful town. Um, I was on a family holiday. Um, I just graduated from uni and I was in that weird place where I, I kind of wasn't really part of uni. I'd, I'd left that world, but I hadn't really entered the wider world of work. And I didn't really know where I fit. And I wasn't really into church and I wasn't very excited by God. But I was on this family holiday in, in Florence, and I remember walking through a piazza, like a big square in Florence, and beautiful scenery. The architecture was, there was a sunset, there was a, it's pretty idyllic. But I just thought, dropping into my head, I don't care about anybody. I remember being shocked by that thought. I remember thinking, if I stayed in Italy for the rest of my life and never saw anybody that I knew ever again, I wouldn't really care. I wouldn't really mind. I could give or take other people, other relationships. And I just remember being shocked by that revelation. And looking back, I know that it was God just giving me that moment of clarity. But I realized at that point that I was at a crossroads. That I could either choose to embrace that and say, okay, well, I might as well pursue a course, pursue a life that serves my own interests, that creates a comfortable existence for myself and, and make that number one. Or I could go a different route and pursue love, connection and relationship. I didn't know how to do it, but I, I did make a decision, however tentative that day, to pursue the second option and to pursue love. And it was uh, not too long after that that I got involved in, um, uh, in youth, in being a youth leader, which was starting up at, at that time. And I remember um, being given a group of young guys to look out for. And looking back, I can really see the years that followed that point was really a time, a season of me learning to care for other people, learning to catch God's heart for other people, learning to look beyond myself and, and see what God saw in other people. And a really key part of that process was prayer. I remember every uh, Sunday evening, we'd have a youth leaders meeting and Jamie would, would challenge us. He'd say, are we praying for our young people? Are we holding them before God? Are we asking him what he thinks about them? And I remember being challenged by that and I really took it on. I started praying for these four or five young people and um, I didn't really know how to do it, but I just very, very tentatively just started asking God, what do you have heart for these people? And as I did that, to stir in me, and it was really the beginning of a journey. Um, one of the clearest, most beautiful pictures of intercession I believe we have in the Bible is actually in Jesus himself. And there are so many examples throughout the Gospels of moments where we get this glimpse, this window into Jesus's prayer life for his disciples. Um, there's the moment when he sees Nathaniel and he says, Nathaniel, I saw you under the fig tree. He had this kind of prophetic picture of Nathaniel when, when praying under the fig tree. Um, there's a moment when he looks at Peter and, and calls out his destiny and says, on this rock, I will build my church. There's a moment later in Peter's life before Peter um, denies Jesus when Jesus says, I have prayed for you that your faith may not fail. And then, of course, there's the famous 
passage in John 17, where Jesus is praying for his disciples and praying for unity and, and oneness, the kind of oneness we see in Acts 1. But we get this picture of Jesus' prayer life, his intercession, his going before the Father on behalf of his friends. And the amazing thing about Jesus' intercession is he's still doing it. He's still doing it right now. It says in Hebrews 7 that when Jesus rose from the dead and ascended to the right hand of the Father, he lives to make intercession on our behalf. So even as we speak, every one of us here today, Jesus is interceding on our behalf. And I love thinking of intercession like that. It's not about me trying harder. It's not about me putting in the hours or trying to wear holes in, in the knees of my jeans or, or whatever it might be. It's about me just joining with Jesus and saying, Jesus, you're already praying for these guys. You're Can I get on board with that? Change my heart to see what you see that Jesus is giving us to say, join me proceeding. Join me in calling out the destiny of the ones that you love. And I remember in that season of being a youth leader, I, I just got caught up in God's heart for these young people. I remember there would be times and I'd be having a conversation and something would just spill out of what I was saying that, that came from that place of prayer, something that God had shown me, something he'd put on my heart, just like uh, I read in the Gospels, Jesus doing something would just come out that, that could only have come from that place of prayer. And that doesn't happen as much as I would like it to happen in my current relationships. I'm not often in conversations where I just find myself speaking God's view of someone over them or encouraging them or something spilling out in that way. But I want it to happen more. And I just feel that, that challenge in this season at the moment to say, am I catching God's heart for my friends in the way that I could be? I don't know about you, but I'm, I'm very good at praying for my friends in crisis or when there's a difficulty Maybe it's an illness or a stress at work or something. I often remember to pray for my friends in those times. And I'm quite good at praying for people that don't know him. If I want them to come to know him, and I'm longing to see them saved. I, I, I'm quite good at remembering to pray for people in those times. But what I'm not so good at remembering to do is praying for my friends just because I want to see them mature, just because I want to see them grow, just because God sees more for them than they're currently in. And that's what I want to get to, that that place of constant coming before God, seeing more for my friends and, and asking God to take them to the next stage. It's not about spiritual firefighting. It's great to pray in times of crisis. It's great to pray for salvation. Both those things are great. But I also just want to come into a place of constant abiding intercession like, like Jesus demonstrates. And I believe he, he wants to help us do that. I remember there was one time um, when I was just praying in tongues one afternoon, didn't particularly have an agenda. And one particular friend just, just came into my mind just persistently. Started praying for them. I didn't really know what to say, um, but I just started declaring things and, and praying out for them. And a couple of hours later, that friend texted me and said, I've got a job interview today. Do you mind praying for me? And I remember thinking, wow, I've already been, been doing it. And for me, that was a taste of what it means to step into that place of abiding prayer, just like Jesus was in. So the second thing that, that Bonhoeffer mentions is this idea of corporate prayer. And I want to just, just take a few moments to consider that. Just like we see in this passage of Acts, people coming together and praying and encountering him together. And actually, the more I think of the book of Acts, the more I think about the early church, I see that this is a constant thread running throughout the life of, of the early church. The really, the story of Acts is the story of, of the people of God encountering him together, whether it's here in the upper room in Acts 1, whether it's when the Spirit falls at Pentecost, they're together, whether it's the moment when they're crying out to God to see Peter released from prison, whether it's the moment when they're praying over Paul and Barnabas before sending them off on their missionary journey, whether it's Paul and Silas in prison, or Paul kneeling on the, the beach at Ephesus before he says goodbye to the Ephesian church, praying with them. There's this thread of the people of God encountering Jesus together. I remember, um, many of you remember Bonnie, um, who spent a year with us, our friend from, from Kenya. I remember one evening at development group, we were talking about shared life. What, what is shared life? How do we do it? 
and we're throwing around ideas of you know it's spending more time together it's having fun and and all of that is is great and it is shared life and, and bonnie just posed the question he said if our life is in jesus and everything that we are is in him surely shared life has to involve sharing the life that we have in jesus together and i remember that just just really challenged me and it's times of fun and being together but it's adding something more that awareness of of jesus that i talked about earlier that, that awareness of his presence with us in our conversations in our gatherings whatever that might look like there's a, a worship song with a line in it that says i don't want to talk about you like you're not in the room. I remember Jamie challenged us a while back to consider what would it be like if we realized that Jesus was in the midst of our conversations. And when I talk about praying corporately and together, that's really what I'm thinking about. I'm not thinking about organizing a meeting. I'm thinking about just inviting that spirit of prayer, that awareness of Jesus being part of our conversation into the conversations that we're already having. I'm aware we're in quite difficult restrictions at the moment, and this might pose some challenges at least for the next few weeks but maybe there's some creative ideas that God could be dropping into our minds as we consider how we might do this at this time maybe it's a, a prayer walk together maybe it's a prayer run together I don't know if that's your your thing uh, maybe it's sharing a meal over zoom and giving thanks together maybe it's um, sending pictures of or words of encouragement over whatsapp um, John came up with a great idea of, you know, instead of bring a bottle or bring a dessert, bring a word of encouragement. What, what about that? Um, there's p perhaps ideas that we can think about to, to inject this awareness of Jesus into what we're, we're doing. But I think there's something about moving from that place of just spending time together, just trying out of our own strength to go deeper and actually inviting him into that conversation. As we talk about friendship at this time, I'm quite aware that the word friendship might mean different things to different ones of us. Um, some of us might be thinking, great, I've got tons of friends. Um, when, when can I start? Some of us might be thinking, I've got too many friends. I don't know where to, where to begin. Others may be thinking, oh, I don't, I don't know if I really have friends, or I don't really know if I have people that I have stuff in common with. likely friends they were different ages different careers different temperaments but there was something that jesus did supernaturally that brought them together to that place of oneness that place of unity that we read about in acts and really for me it comes back to jesus it's like in the verse that um nick read this morning that i think chris shared it said our fellowship is with the Father and with Jesus. It's about the barrier that he has broken down between us and God, between us and other people, just like he did for me. Him as he intercedes for us on our behalf to join him in that place of prayer and that place of intercession. I'm not there yet. I know my heart isn't as soft as it could be, um, but I want to invite him to, to soften my heart again. Jesus, take me back to that place of love, of care, of prayer, um, as we consider what it means to be friends at this time. Thank you for listening to this podcast by Lifeline Church. We hope this message has been an encouragement to you. We are a relational church with a passion to demonstrate God's love to one another and our surrounding community in real and practical ways. We believe that God has called us to have an impact on our families, our communities and our nation. We'd love to connect further with you, so please do visit our website at lifelinechurch.co.uk, on Facebook, lifeline.church.uk or Twitter at lifelineuk.com.